We are almost there, Stars fans. Welcome to another edition of Off-Season Spits and Suds. And pretty soon we won't have to say Off-Season. I'm Gavin Spittle of 105.3 The Fan, and a huge thank you to all of you who have stuck with us and listened to these Off-Season podcasts. I believe we're the, one of the only people doing Stars Off-Season podcasts, and it's because you guys requested it, and we truly appreciate it. Joined, as I always am, by our Stars Insider, and he's also an NHL Insider, EP Rinkside. Shap Shots. You got to follow him on Twitter at Sean Shapiro. You got a book out called We Win Here. Sean, how are you, my friend? I'm pretty good. I uh, get to make the the pretty drive up to Traverse City tomorrow. I get to go watch a real uh, get to get to watch a hockey game tomorrow between uh, the Stars prospects and the Red Wings prospects tomorrow afternoon. Or sorry, uh, early early evening, late afternoon, and we'll. Uh, it, it's fun. It's uh, I've said it. I may sound like a broken record on this, but it's for me, the Traverse City tournament's always kind of the start of hockey season and gets everything going. So it's it's an exciting time around here. I I always like having you as a partner because when it comes to the Stanley Cup or when it comes to tournaments like this that Stars fans want to know, I say we will be carrying and we will be covering this tournament when in actuality it's Sean that's covering it. And I'm kind of back here, but at the same time, I'll take full credit. Thank you, Sean. Always, always, always there. You're always there in, in thought, though. Oh, right. I know, I, I know. And we were just talking about. I mean, what a great time of year to be at Traverse City. That I oh, mean, yeah. RJ Choppy. Uh, we have a deal with um, Gaylord, uh, Gaylord, Michigan, which has amazing golf courses, and uh, we do a trip up there every single year um, to to Gaylord. RJ goes up there, and he just cannot stop talking about how gorgeous it is in Michigan that time of year. Yeah, it's it's a good time of year. It's a really good time of year. So, all right. So, Stars fans, we'll get into this because we want to talk about some of the top prospects and who Sean is going to look for in this Traverse City um, tournament coming up, and who's going to shine. And we've seen some current stars shine in the past, so we'll also reference that. And Sean will tell you what he's looking for. So, I'm excited to hear that. You guys also responded big time with our mailbag. Uh, So we're going to have a lot of questions that we're going to answer on the back end of this podcast. So it's going to be a busy podcast today, and we love it. But we did want to touch on the news of the day, and the news of the day comes out of Columbus, where a bit of a controversy was stirred. And I always like to give reference, so what I want to do is play the cut, and it comes from Spitting Chicklets. If you are not aware of Spitting Chicklets, they are probably the hockey podcast as far as its two former players. Uh, Mr. Whitney and Mr. Bissonette, along with, you know, others, and it's through Barstool Sports, and they have a lot of former players on, just for reference, and they were talking about Mike Babcock, and he came up in conversation, and here's what they had to say. This is outrageous, dude. I get a text from a a player. He goes, have you heard what Babcock is up to again? And I'm like... No. So he gets to Columbus, and one of the first things he does is he calls in Boone Jenner, the captain of the team, and he says, let me see the photos in your phone. I want to know the type of person you are. What the f*** is going on? Is that is that even legal? I, 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 it feels like it's totally I illegal. I get him on the podcast to grill him about his antics as a head coach. Like, worry about the f***ing forecheck. Worry about your 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 personnel worry about getting the power play humming at an alarming rate so you might have a chicken dicks chance of sneaking in a wild card spot why do you want to see throbbing dick pics <laughs> from your captain on his iphone i don't understand this by the way if i was going into one of these meetings having heard all these stories prior i'm putting on like rocky quotes on my photos oh, yeah. i'm putting on like my workout routine oh yeah you know what i would put on my phone i'd be f- Standing here in this chair with my bin staring him right in the eye with me holding my legs like this. What's wrong with this guy? Now, I hope this story is true because then we look like real big idiots. But I think that Mike Babcock should come on this podcast and yep. clear the air as to why he wants to see Pierce Nipples from Instagram thoughts in his players' phones. So, Sean, the Columbus Blue Jackets <laughs> immediately responded. <laughs> and Mike Babcock said the following. 
While meeting with our players and staff, I asked them to share off their phones family pictures as part of the process of getting to know them better. There was absolutely nothing more to it than that. The way this was portrayed on the Spit and Chicklets podcast was a gross misrepresentation of those meetings and extremely offensive. These meetings have been very important and beneficial, not only for me, but for our players and staff as well. And to have them depicted like this is irresponsible and completely inaccurate. Boone Jenner, the captain uh, of the Blue Jackets, responded, While meeting with Babs, he asked me about my family and where I'm from, my upcoming wedding and hockey-related stuff. He then asked if I had pictures of my family, and I was happy to share some with him. He showed me pictures of his family. I thought it was a great first meeting and a good way for us to start to build a relationship. To have this blown out of proportion is truly disappointing. I mean, it's, you want, yeah, yeah, go, yeah. Sean. So, it's just, do, it's a tough, it's a I, I, tough thing. I, and, and we should be clear on this. Uh, since this has happened, Paul Bissonette, who the voice you heard on that clip the, is the, who was one of the hosts of Spit and Chicklets and is also, uh, you've probably seen his work on TNT. He's on the panel for Turner, uh, has on Twitter doubled down yes. and said that and defended that he's had that, that it's well sourced. He's shown a screen grab, screen grab basically from a allegedly from a player that used to play for Babcock that uh that he's getting guys to do this on their screen now it should be should be clarified here on this show that that text that Bissonette showed clearly comes from a player not currently on Columbus so that's also an interesting you know, wrinkle in the evidence that has been put out there um do you want to talk about the Babcock part or the media part of this first? Because to me, there's two fascinating elements of this, Gavin. Which one do you want to talk about first? Here? I, I agree. I agree. Let's let's start with Babcock because obviously yeah. he's the headline. And for reference, yeah. Mike Babcock yeah. was the former coach of the Toronto Maple Leafs. And after his departure, a lot was said about his coaching style, how he treated players. Yeah. So Babcock... There's a couple of famous, then the most famous one for Stars fans will be one of the reasons that Mike Madonna famously played 1,499 career games was because Mike Babcock healthy scratched him late in that late season in Detroit. Um, that's why Mike Madonna did not get 1,500 career games. Um, Madonna has said this himself. Madonna hasn't really grinded an axe about it. Um, he's let others do it for him. Um, to tell you a little bit more about Mike Madonna as someone who has covered Mike, uh, well, not covered him in person during his career, but has covered him since he wrote the foreword for my one, my other book. Um, the first book I wrote, um, Mike is not a person who likes to get in public arguments on things. He's someone who will occasionally, will occasionally see it happen on Twitter, but in general, he tries not to get overly into things. So it doesn't surprise me that he's never gone fully in on what his true emotions were about not getting to 1,500 games. And then uh, Mike Commodore who is a player who played in the NHL for a long time, actually covered him with the Texas stars for a little bit. has been very publicly open about how Mike Babcock treated players in his view and everything like that. And one of the bigger things, obviously two other data points here, um, you on Franzen, when from Detroit, his time in Detroit, I think he's the quote, and I'm paraphrasing this because I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but it's something along the lines of Babcock's one of the worst humans he's ever dealt with. Um, and then Mitch Marner told kind of a similar story of, be, of basically kind of being embarrassed of being asked to rank how hard players worked on the team and then Babcock allegedly sharing that with the team. Um, Mike Babcock is an old school coach. Mike Babcock is... And I'm not defending that. I want to be clear on something. He's an old school coach who's now playing, who is still coaching into an age where your your flaws and what you're doing gets exposed or gets brought out into the public. Um, I we like one of the things I, I remember if like for example, if Brett Hull was playing today. A lot of the stuff Brett Hull did during his playing days, and Brett Hull has talked about this stuff publicly before. That's why I don't have an issue saying Brett Hull. If Brett Hull was doing the stuff he was did during his playing days and he was playing in today's game, 
he would be in trouble. He would get in a lot of hot water. But because there was no social media then, there was no players weren't really having the the, the space to share this stuff and everything like that. It kind of flew under the radar. So Babcock is an old school coach with an old school mentality who was needed to, I mean, I personally don't understand how he got the Columbus job because um, in my personal view, I think there's so many other qualified candidates who would have been great for that job. So I personally, on a hockey coaching perspective, I don't see why he's the coach in Columbus, but on a, this incident, this is in line with who he is as far as he's been known to ask for players photos before he did it in Toronto. He did it in Detroit. Um, I went to that. Uh, I, I once saw Mike Babcock speak at a coaching clinic actually. And he talked about building a rapport with his players by wanting to get to know their families. And he brought up to other coaches of you get to know people's families by sharing photos by sharing photos of your families and him sharing his own family photos with them. So the, the concept of taking uh, Mike Babcock asking for photos off someone's phone, that's not new. I, I believe that happened. I truly believe that happened. Um, I think it's also the type of thing, Gavin, where a player's level of comfort really depends on how this feels. Right. Where if you're your boss and I'm saying this to the general listener right now, if your boss walks into your office and says, hey, can I look at your phone? What, 80 percent of us are probably going to seize up and like, no, that, that's mine. That's like yes. that's my personal space. Right. Yes. But like a couple of us will be like a couple of us will be like, yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. But most humans, if your boss comes in and say, hey, let me look through your phone or show me something off your phone. You're like, you're my boss. You're not my husband or wife, you don't get that. Right. Like, so it's, I think it's, it's, it's a space where for players, I can get where it feels uncomfortable because it can feel like an abuse of power because while the coach may claim, well, the coach may claim, Hey, if you're not comfortable, don't do it. We all know there's a power dynamic and saying no is going to be, could is 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 so it, there's there's too much external pressure you can't say no to it or whatever right so it's i i truly believe that this stuff happens i don't think and babcock even said like hey that happened um and i i, I think kind of this showing pictures of guys families getting to know guys and everything like that i think that is part of his approach and i think that's part of his thing when it comes to i don't know and the part that I've yet to the part I have a hard time knowing on this is I don't get, I have a hard time seeing the imagery of somebody taking somebody's phone. And and I mean, on spit and chicklets, they claimed that he airplayed him to his TV or whatever and stuff like that of all of a sudden him like going through all his the guys, old pictures and, seeing what he took pictures of and everything like that. To me, I imagine this, this was more of a, Hey, you have a family, you have a wife and kids. I want to know you better. Who is this? That's what this feels like a lot to me. And I'm not trying, I want to be clear on something very clear to our listeners on this. I am not defending Mike Babcock. I don't think he should be coaching in the NHL right now. I really don't. But I also think there are spaces where, and I also don't think, he should be asking for a guy's phone. I re- I don't think. No, um, never. I don't think he should be asking, asking guys phone. If he's talking to a guy, say he's talking to Boone Jenner, who unfortunately got roped into all this. If him and Boone Jenner are talking about family stuff and Boone Jenner says, Hey, here, let me show you my wife and kids. That's different. So I don't think Babcock should be asking for a guy's phone. All of that being said, where this is where, if it would just been presented the way I just presented it on spit chicklets, we could have had a true discourse about this, right? We could have had a true conversation about consent. We could have had a true conversation about what is and isn't appropriate with an employee, with a boss and um, uh, 
uh, someone who reports to a boss, though I'm, I can't, can't I talk right now, uh, who and what is what is proper conduct and, and consent and everything like that. If it had presented the way we just presented it on Spent Chicklets, we could have had that proper conversation. When Spent and Chicklets starts adding some narrative of, well, he wants to take their phone. He wants to see the nipple pictures. He wants to see this and that and everything like that. That jump that that made this jump the shark and took us away from the important conversation that took us like the important conversation gavin that i want to just lay out real quick is mike babcock should not be asking guys for pictures on their phone that's that's just it's not it's not a fair thing for a coach to do correct he shouldn't be doing that that, i think we both agree on that he shouldn't be doing that if a guy like right well yeah because there's (laughs) sports and there's real life and i will tell you in real life i'm a boss and I yeah. oversee, I don't know, 50 to 100 people at any given time. And I've never asked for pictures. It's, yeah. you know, if and, someone's dating somebody and they tell me about it, I said, oh, wow, I look forward to meeting them. And I kind of leave it at that. Yeah. Or, you know, I get to know I get to know the people, but I don't ask for pictures. If they want to show me pictures or if they want to see pictures in my personal life and I feel comfortable, happy to do it. But I've always taken the tack as a boss, and I know sports is different. Yeah, I've always taken the tack of what you think could be appropriate, take two steps back, and that's the line right there. Because I've always felt like if if guys are talking in a room, you know, you either have to say it's inappropriate or you leave that room. But you have to say, you know, guys, I'm going to leave this conversation now. You know, this isn't. You know, if if something like this is happening, but if it's happening as far as a structure and it's talking about another employee, then I have to stay in that room and I have to address it because that's, you know, my job. And he's in a tough position because, you know, he's a coach, but at the same time, he does want to have some bonding. And I'm guessing after what happened to him in several stops and what has been said about him with other players Maybe he's trying to find that bond with the players that he hasn't been able to find in the past. But, you know, I agree with you. When they started joking about it and stuff like that, it kind of changed the narrative. I will say this. Well, about, and that's, yeah. yeah, go, go well, ahead. And I, th- I, I think that's important here. Like, full stop, he should not be asking for guys' phones. He should not be asking Correct. for pictures on guys' phones. That's That's it. That's Mike Babcock is wrong there. That is a simple thing. Where this goes... Where this becomes a media conversation right now, and we're in this brave new media world. We've talked about it on this podcast before. We've talked about what happens now that the Dallas Morning News, for example, like in the Dallas Stars land, right? There's no full time beat writer for the Morning News. The Athletic does not have a full time Stars beat writer. They've moved the person to the Cowboys. Um, they have. Uh, I it's. There's more people doing independent things. There's I, I'm 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 doing the stuff on the Substack space. The pod, podcasts are becoming more and more of a media space and everything like that. And one of the things about this stuff that is, and I'm not even going to go with the decorum. I'm just going to talk about the, the kind of the, the the spot of it is. This is one of those things where. Spit and chiglets, spit, spit and chiclets is so large, and, and the players trusted and everything like that. And it's okay to they're a they like to pretend they are they're a personality um, storytelling podcast until they aren't right. And then there's times when it becomes oh well this is a news dump or you have this because they get they have players who to text them directly. They are they do are well connected. I believe that there was an uncomfortable player who texted Paul Bissonnette about this and that that's what happened. Uh from Paul Bissonnette's standpoint though, I think there's a decorum and there's an understanding of you have to present the facts as, as you have them. And he doesn't know. There's no facts that Babcock is scrolling through these photos for for nude pictures or, or whatever or anything like that. It's It was strong enough to say, hey, he's asking guys for their phones. That's not right. 
strong enough to leave it at that. When you start pushing it the other way, you start going that way. And then when you start doubling down on Twitter, telling guys to F off and everything like that, um, it's a tough spot for a lot of people right now, because as I mentioned earlier, you have one of the main broadcasters Mm -hmm. now for the NHL, one of the national broadcasters for the NHL, one of their panelists quote tweeting the Columbus blue jacket statement with tell Babs to knock off the bullshit enough with putting guys on the spot in the coach's room. Yada, 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 basically just, and it's, Paul Bissonnette got where he is in the world because of who he is. And I understand not I'm, and I understand that and everything, but this is one of those spaces where there's a bit of decorum you show about handling something so we can have the proper discussion. This conversation today should just be a simple cut and dry. Like Mike Babcock didn't have to defend asking players to like the Blue Jackets were just able to put out a uh we're able to just put out a statement where it's like, oh, this was a gross misrepresentation of it. And it is a gross misrepresentation of it. Mike, the Blue Jackets haven't answered the question about why is does he feel right to ask someone for their phone? And he probably never will answer that right. question. But because of how it, Bissonette brought it out, it's, it, it made all that Columbus had to do was react to the extreme as opposed to getting to the real root of the problem. It just It's one of those where sometimes just the measured the measured factual, this is what I know and this is what I can report allows us to get to the truth or allows us to actually discuss the real problem as opposed to, well, we need to really break down the imagery of Mike Babcock looking through a guy's phone for nipple pictures or something like that. And that's this is where Mike Babcock is wrong. He was wrong. He shouldn't be asking for a guy's phone. Paul Bissonnette in this case is wrong in how he put this out there because he really sidetracked it and made it about himself when this could have been about Mike Babcock and having a better conversation about consent and, and things along those lines, as opposed to turning it into a viral, he said, he said type show. And maybe that's what Bissonnette wanted all the time. Maybe that is what he wanted. Maybe he got what he wanted. But well, I think you've done a good I, I, job. So. Like what you yeah. haven't done in this conversation, Sean has gone like old school media person, like, talking about spitting chiclets as far as not being a media source, because you realize just like I realize, I mean, spitting chiclets has done a lot to me for the game of hockey. You know, they've, 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 they've talked about it in a way that relates to the younger generation. They do the sandbagger tournament where they have players and you see players in their natural environment, not with microphones in front of them and talking trash. And they have brought language to the table that, you know, we didn't, you know, sometimes no, if we weren't in the hockey circles like pigeon and chirping and, and all those kinds of things. So I think they've done a lot for the game. And I think Paul Bissonnette brings a lot of personality to the TNT uh, broadcast. Uh, I do want to highlight something you said earlier, because I think we need to double down on this. And I think spit and chicklets would agree. We feel bad for Boone Jenner because yeah. there's a captain yes, of yes. the team. And what could Boone Jenner do? And that's that's the issue. And Boone Jenner mm-hmm. has to relate to the rest of his team, also has to relate to the opposition. You know, Boone Jenner's been in the league for a while. He's a very respected person, and he had to come out. And, you know, hopefully it doesn't ruin the relationship if there is one with Spit and Chicklets. Hopefully it doesn't in any way hurt his relationship with Columbus, the players in Columbus. So, it's just disappointing, and and I I agree with you. I think Mike Babcock has to go over and above on these situations based on his past. There have been too many things surrounding Mike Babcock for him just to move on, and I think that's what they're yeah. trying to do with that statement. Yeah, and that's and it's it's I don't have an issue with the story being brought to light. I don't have an issue with us having a really good conversation, like. There could be a really good con. This yeah. could have led to, or this could have led to a really good conversation. This could have led to a really good conversation about power dynamics. This could have led to a really good conversation about, okay, where other reporters 
would have been allowed to ask the Blue Jackets and be like, hey, like, have you guys talked to Mike about what this means to take a guy's phone? Does he understand the power dynamic of this? Where the headline is Bissonette versus Babcock. And that's not what it should be. The headline should be Mike Babcock is doing something that's abusing power that probably 15, 20 years ago would have been widely accepted as not abusing power just because that's how hockey culture was. And now it's and now we're in a better spot where we can have these conversations. Yeah. We lost that main conversation and we lost that because of how it was delivered media wise. And I think that's kind of part of the responsibility of, of media right now that kind of is really changing where, and it's kind of one of the things that scares me a little bit as we figure out the future of this industry, right? Like I opinion pieces, columns, um, sharing your views on something. It's all great. Like it's, it's good, but we also still need that space of, Hey, this is the facts we have instead of had them now. So we can approach them the right way. And like, I'm never going to like, like, and we joke about a lot about this podcast, Gavin, but I, if all of a sudden we were going to, I don't even want to make anything up, but like, I'm not going to make something up because that's ridiculous. But like, if we were to be like, oh, well, we know this about the Dallas Stars, I'm going to say what I know. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go add a superfluous, colorful detail just because it moves on this conversation. Yeah. And I think that's something that, um, it changed, it changed the narrative. And that's what, it's just a kind of this whole thing is a side effect of the media world we're in right now. And at the end of the day, just to get back to the beginning of this, I feel bad for Boone Jenner. I feel bad for any Blue Jackets player because you're going to get asked about this and there's only one real answer you can give. And I feel bad because we didn't get the instead of and and not feel, and, and at the end of the day, Mike Babcock should not be asking for pictures off players phones. That's Correct. personal. That's private. And People are allowed to be personal, private, and keep it away from their employer. Now, we also have to add the NHLPA is going to be involved, and they're launching an investigation, and they're going to look into this. So, not saying that any yeah. answers will come of it, but we'll see. The fact that they're yeah. looking into it means that, you know, they take this very seriously, and I can appreciate that. And I can also appreciate the sources that Spit and Chicklets have over the years, they're obviously former players and, and kudos to them, you know, and they have a lot of players on their side. So, you know, I want them to continue what they're doing because I think it grows the great game of hockey. And I want, yeah. you know, other people to continue what they're doing as well. So I, I just hope it can be resolved and moved on. And I, I agree with you. There were two things when I didn't agree with the Babcock hire, but it really bugged me that Mike Babcock was hired so quickly out of the gate when his Toronto deal was up. It was almost it was, like was, those parts was, were in place, and that's what frustrates me. Like, you it must was, have... Though, yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it's yeah. not almost... Yeah, it's, it's, it's not like... It's not... It's not... It's not... I mean, I'm sure that lawyers have... The, the lawyers... The lawyers sure would say no, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the lawyers would say no, but we all know it. Like, I mean, I know Babcock gave a talk this summer on, like, June 27th or something like that. And it was, he was introduced as a NHL coach. And he even said at that time, oh, I'm a Leafs employee right now. Like, wink, wink. Like, I know that happened. I personally know that happened. Mm -hmm. Because on July 1st, he would be no longer a Leafs employee, no longer collecting $5 million per year from Toronto, and free a free agent where he would get the most of his money everywhere. So it's, it's, it happened. It definitely happened. It was all in place before Columbus. It's I know people will be like the lawyers will have crossed their T's and I's and all that stuff to make sure that legally it was done right. But we all know how this works. Everyone tampers. It's just those who get caught are the ones that actually get punished. There's punishments for tampering too far and getting caught. Everyone tampers and everyone does all of that. And like the Babcock one was just a blatant like a blatant disregard for the actual sp spirit of the law of the system. So, All right, let's get into this Traverse City because we have do have a lot of questions. Yeah. And thank you guys yeah. for 
you know, that that's a big story in the NHL. So uh, I'm so glad we, you know, addressed it. But moving on, uh, Traverse City starting. Sean's going to cover it. Let's talk about some of the players that you are really going to have a keen eye because I love the story you told when Miro went to Traverse City. You could clearly see this guy yeah. not only has it, but he's way ahead of everyone else on the ice. So what kind of yep. names are you looking for? And as Stars fans, when we read your recap, who should we be looking for? Yeah, and I believe it. And I don't have the full details of where and how the Stars are doing it, but I do know the uh, the Red Wings are streaming their games and they're making the links available to the other three teams to stream their games. So um, if I get these Stars streaming links, I will send them out on Twitter and all that stuff um, because you should be able to, you hopefully will be able to watch from home. Um the uh, obviously the the stars three best prospects are playing in this tournament and Logan Stankov and Maverick Bork and and Liam Bixel and um Bork is and Bork's goalie those three are always interesting Bixel of those three is probably the most interesting for me coming into this tournament because he's coming over from playing in the Swedish league playing in Europe uh, coming off a broken ankle um. Ankles are weird things, so it's going to be interesting to see it the first time in live action. And uh, it's so I'm really interested to see Bixel in action and just see how, because he's going to be making his full-time adjustment to North America this year. I think there's going to be a learning curve he's going to have to adjust, and it all really starts in Traverse City. Um, the Stankoven is going to be interesting too, but it's, to me, Stankoven, the only way Stankoven and Bork to the same degree the only reason that their their tournament would be notable to me at all would be if they struggle because i expect them to be better than their peers i expect them to show up and be better than their peers if they aren't better than their peers that becomes more notable and we have a different we have a different discussion um there's a couple then you kind of look at after that i kind of start focusing more so Honestly, looking a little bit more at some of the defensive things. I look at Grishnikov, I look at a Christian Cairo, um, Tristan Bertucci, um, just some guys who, because uh, I, th- I think defensemen in this tournament, you start to get an idea of how they, uh, how they read the game and the uh, and how they read the game, how they react. I kind of want to see them start moving. Um, like for example, for example, Bertucci, um, who was the star second round pick this past year, um, he's really got to beef up before he's an NHL option. He's only 18. We'll see him play in this tournament. Then he'll go back to Flint. Um, but really good player and like one on one defending, but always and hasn't always been the greatest like team defender. I'm interested to kind of see what he does in a team system. Um, Kairu, I really like how he moves the puck. I think there's some de- exciting things there. So. That's 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 a good one. Um, and then there's like you look and then there's some other ones that are just kind of you look at it and you are giving them an opportunity to impress you and make a mark. So you're like, hey, I'm going to pay more attention to that guy. Um, the Matthew Seminoffs of the world. Um, I know very little about Angus McDonald uh, or McDonnell, depending on how it's pronounced. Um, he was taken late in this last draft, but I'm like, obviously a guy like that can come in and show us who he is for the first time. Um, if you see an older player, like an Oscar Bach, yeah. who's on this roster or a Matty Blumel, um, and this also goes for Bork too, they should be the leaders on this team. They should be the best players on this, uh, in this tournament for Dallas. If the older players aren't the best players in this roster, in this tournament, you can start to ask why, and we can start to look at that a little bit more. Um, Remy Poirier for Dallas is the Remy I got my Poirier eye on him. should be. Yep. Yeah. Like he uh he has a chance this year to I'm interested to see kind of his like Remy Poirier is interesting because for the stars um goalie depth right now, right? Like if they need if if Scott Wedge was getting to hurt and they needed a goalie to to back up tomorrow, it would be Matt Murray. But I think I think in the long run, I think Remy Poirier is a better will be a better goalie than Matt Murray. I don't think he's a better goalie this very second, but in the long run, I think he's better. And so I'm interested to kind of watch that track and that that path kind of go forward too. You know, one, the of, the other, thing, one yeah, of the other names, yeah. you you just mentioned Seminoff, and I just wanted to add, yeah. I'll be interested to see, does the coaching staff 
since he was teammates with Stankoven, do they put them together, Sean? See, that's a great question because it's you could do it, and you could do it as a as a as a as a philosophy of you want this, you want to build a comfort level for this for this kid coming out of as he goes pro, and maybe they could play together. At, maybe I mean I think Seminole will return to Kamloops honestly this year. He's only nineteen, so yeah, he could go back for his own. But there's a great year. relationship there, and I just there, wonder. There, and yeah, and and there's a comfort level, yeah. but at the same time. Do you want to make them all uncomfortable? These, <laughs> or, or you do you want do you want to make everyone do you want to make it so you learn everything about the player? Mm-hmm. You don't want I want to learn more about Matthew Seminoff himself as opposed to the support piece for Logan Stankoven, right? So I think that's I think it's a fair question to ask. I also have a feeling that if Logan Stankoven comes out and has a great tournament the first two games, I don't think he'll play the third game anyway. So there may be a way to do get a little bit of both worlds, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I didn't see him on the roster. Tell me about Ertun Martino. You're going, you're going, you're going. To, I'm going deep. I want to make sure I've, you're really not going deep. I just want to make sure I've got my, I always have my, uh, well, okay. So, I can, well, there's an easy answer. Our team Martino is still in college. That's why it's not okay. there. So, so for a quick reminder to everyone, now, now, now I know why exactly why I didn't pop right away. Um, college prospects are not, uh, this is, if you're a college pro, if you're a co- prospect who's in college, you're not at this tournament because uh, only, only players from junior and guys who have signed who are, are in Traverse city. Martino, I believe is about to play his junior year at Clarkson and uh he'll uh he'll be in theory i guess and this may even change in the in the nil future gavin and i have no idea this is a uh, something but for right now playing in this tournament would hurt his uh eligibility for NCAA Got it. Stuff. great point so that's kind okay of, that's, that's that's one of the reasons that this doesn't happen for college players okay so. okay so you when you when you watch this tournament, you just see are you looking for confidence on ice, puck control, how they handle themselves? What did you see when you saw Hashkinen that set him apart? The uh well with with Miro, like it was everything. It was like watching one guy play hockey and everyone else play something different. Like it was that's the that's how good Miro Hayeshkin is at hockey, Gavin. Like I, I, I'm going to talk lovingly for a second. Like that's okay. Watching Miro, he- watching Miro Hayeshkin and play hockey is a joy. It is a pleasure, and we should all embrace it. And we should all, you should look at it. You should watch Miro Hayeshkin and play hockey every shift, and feel blessed you picked a team to watch where you get to watch him play every every shift because he is a joy to watch play hockey. And when you see when you saw him in Traverse city against players, his age against other 19 year olds, you're like this, what what, was the skating. It was the poise. It was the way the entire game just orbited around him. It was just, it was like, it was the perfect storm of this guy is different. And that's really what's the best way I can put on it. And and this tournament was kind of, and I know he didn't like, it wasn't a Miro situation, but you began to see the blossoming as far as chatter regarding Wyatt Johnston. Is that correct? Uh, sort of. Yeah. Not, it wasn't nearly as, uh, I mean, Johnston wasn't as Johnston was good at this tournament last yep. year. Let's be clear on that. He was good, but it wasn't the, it wasn't the, well, Wyatt Johnston is one of the finest 19 year old players on the planet type moments it wasn't like that um he was good and then why johnston would had a tremendous rookie year and, and proved he belongs in the nhl but it, in the tournament he didn't have the it wasn't the tournament like what miro hashkin did and why johnston will never be as good as miro hashkin that's not a slight against why johnston it's just how good miro is um i am interested to see the feeling i get watching this tournament we talked a lot about columbus at the start of this podcast with the coaching situation but i'm really interested to see what feeling I get watching um, Adam Fantilli in this tournament, the number three pick last year from the draft, because Fantilli, I watched him play 
four or five games in college this past season. And Adam Fantilli in college hockey was head and shoulders better than everyone else. And I'm interested to see if I get that same feeling in this tournament, just to see how it looks, because he's someone who could have a bit of that Hishkinen effect, albeit as a center. So um, I, I, I've seen other players at this tournament who became great players who were just okay or took steps and maybe needed Traverse City to do that. Like, for example, Jason Robertson didn't wow me in Traverse City the first time I saw him. He was he was okay. He was good, but he didn't wow me. But that's also one of those things because Jason Robertson's game, if you remember it and you look at it now, the 104 points or whatever it was last season are great. But remember, Gavin, yeah, you watch enough stars hockey. Jason Robertson doesn't wow you until no. he puts the puck in the net. That's no. the beauty of Jason Robertson's game. So if Jason Robertson isn't scoring, he's not wowing you. And I think this is one of those tournaments where there are certain players who might kind of hide, who who might kind of get lost on the fringes or whatever. Um, the one story I always like to tell about Traverse City, and I'll tell it again right now, is the Matthias Janmark story. Uh, Matthias Janmark was supposed to come, was came over from Sweden, was supposed to play in the Traverse City tournament, and then after the Traverse City tournament, was supposed to go back to Sweden. He had literally actually. It's, 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 it's I'll, I'll tell the second part of the story next, but he, uh, so he was supposed to go straight from Traverse city to fly back to Sweden. Matthias Janmark looked so comfortable, so confident in Traverse city that, that Dallas said, you know what? Let's give this kid a try in actual training camp. He earned that job. He stayed in the NHL, became a fixture in Dallas for a couple of years, even with the one year away because of the, uh, with, the, with the degenerative knee injury. And like, Yenmark and his in his team and a bunch of his friends back in Sweden had actually had a fantasy hockey league that they had actually drafted already. And like so he was actually all of a sudden like he was the first <laughs> the story goes Matthias had a uh he was he was kind of scared to he was he, he was he was he wasn't willing to pick himself up on waivers in his own fantasy hockey league because he thought he was going to have to go back to Sweden during training camp. Wow. So uh, but Matthias Yemark is an example of how Traverse City can be a building block for a player on the cusp of something to get that extended look over the next two and a half weeks in training camp. And that's the big thing. I think that would be my it's like if I was a coach, if I was coaching prospects in this Traverse City tournament, that would be my message of. You're not going to win an NHL job today, so don't go try. Don't go try and kill anyone. Don't do anything crazy. But if you play your game, you can change what the next step is. If you're, um, Maverick Bork, right? By playing a certain level in Traverse City, you can start to make Jim Nil think a little bit harder about maybe, maybe finding a spot to give you about maybe uh, putting you in a spot where maybe you actually have a legit chance to win a training camp roster. If you're um, William and Bixel, like you have an opportunity here where maybe you're not going to make the NHL roster opening night. Let's be clear on that. But like maybe Gavin Bayreuther won't be that first call up in November because maybe we have something in this kid. And if we put some more trust in him over here and here, it's, it's a lot of building future opportunity. And there's a lot of seeds of things that start in Traverse city. Um, The other thing from Traverse city, just to be clear on is just throw out all goalie performances because like I've seen Jake Ottinger struggle. I saw Colton point Duke. I saw Landon bow dominate that tournament so it's 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 too small of a sample size it's too chaotic do not do not put too much into goalie evaluation from this tournament those are kind of my uh get me back on track that's your job get me no i know it is it is i I, you know i'm enjoying this because i was actually just thinking like what style are we expecting and it sounds to me like it's a continuation of the juniors where it's yeah. like, sure, there is some hitting and everything but there's a lot more open ice than let's say you know uh in texas where the ice tightens in the AHL, yeah. and, you, oh, know, yeah. you don't have it, as it's, much it's, movement. Yeah, it's. I mean, it will be the the first period of the first game is going to be 
just chaos. Okay. It is, it will be chaos. It will be, it'll be kids. It'll be play 19, 19 to 22 year old players running around at a thousand miles a minute because it's their first game since April or May. And they're looking to improve, to impress scouts and management right in front of them. The first game they will, the first game of the first period, they will be flying at an unsustainable pace. It will be chaotic. It will be messy. It will be great, but it is unsustainable. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but then, then, then it will even out a little bit. We'll start to see a little bit more calm built into it and everything. Um, this to me is kind of this. It feels a little bit more. A good, I think, a good comparison is. It becomes almost more of like an ECHL game, with some higher end talent sprinkled in that would never play in the ECHL. That's what it feels a lot. Okay. Like. I think that's a good way to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, the, the guy I really focused on is Maverick Bork because I think yeah. with Stankoven, it, it's just the name just isn't mentioned as much as far as like, I know he's among the top prospects in the stars organization. I just really like that second half he had in Texas. And um, I think there's going to be a comfort level this year going into the AHL and uh, I'm expecting big things. I'm expecting him to be in Texas, but I, my goal for this tournament, like you said, and in training camp, I want the stars to say, wow, he's on the cusp or he's really fighting for a roster spot. That that's, that's what I'm hoping and for. It, and if he does that, I know there may not be the spot in camp right away. I think one of the things that Jim Nill unfairly gets criticized for is blocking younger players too much. I think sometimes like, okay, we've talked about the Ryan Suter deal. Yes, that's bad, right? That's bad. That blocked younger players, but Nill has done, has been willing to, if a guy has won his spot or a guy has proven to him that he needs to make a change to a plan, Nill has gone and made the corresponding move. He's been willing to do that. And I think that's something that, um, it is not a blanket. There's no way he's in the NHL this year. It's just the bar for him to clear to be in the NHL is very high. Um, and if he if he earns that, it's going to be great. Yeah, because the kids the kids got a lot of talent. So well, and I think this needs and we really haven't talked about it this off season. We've definitely mentioned the name. This needs to be a a, a bounce back season for Mason Marchment. When we talk about blocking, you know, Mason Marchment. To me, toward the end of last year, Sean, this you know, the salary probably kept him up on a line, but I think Mason Marchment was a fourth line player or a third line player. I, I just wasn't seeing what I'd like to, and uh, you know, I'm hoping well, this year he can you know be better because that you know I don't want to say it's a rich contract, but it's a solid contract where I think the player needs to be performing better because that's where Jim Neal I think has to go in the future to alleviate some cap space is these younger prospects come in and that is where you get that cap space where you can get those pieces. It is, but Gavin, it was a rich contract. It was a, what it was, it was Dallas. It was, it was Dallas. It was Dallas, Nashville and someone else. No, 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 no. Yeah, no, but yeah, but no, but with, with the Marchment deal, it's, it was Dallas and other teams trying to, in their mind, justify that Mason Marchment of the 21-22 season with Florida that won the President's Trophy, that's who he is. To me, and this is going to sound very rough for Stars fans, but it's true, to me, that 26-year-old season is the outlier. Mason Marchment's 26-year-old season, 47 points in 54 games, yeah. that's the outlier. He didn't make the NHL really. He didn't make the NHL. He didn't play his first NHL game until he was 24. He was only a ten, only at 10 points in 33 games as a 25 year old. You get 31. Like, kind of is who he is. Like, and on top of just, that, that was one of the great offensive years from that Florida Panthers team. Yeah. So I, I Mason Marchment is a depth player, and the Stars and other teams after him were hoping that you know what, this was the turn and they made a bet and made a bet on it. And it's, I, I think they made a bad bet on it. It's just Mason Marchment is a depth player. He's not really a goal scorer. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe the, maybe of the, of Mason Marchment's eight 
uh, eight year professional career. Maybe the one year he was a goal scorer or, or the one year he was nearly a point per game scorer in a COVID year. Maybe that's the norm. Or maybe the other seven years are the norm. And that's more likely in my mind. He's not, he's 27. He'll be 28 this season. Yeah. Um, like just sometimes you, but sometimes you, you have to make bets and go after it. Um, it's just like players are who they are a lot of times. Um, I've got something coming tomorrow. If you're, if I got something tomorrow coming over at Shaft Shots where I went and I looked at the, uh, um, or I went and looked at Matt Duchesne's work from Nashville and the past season and everything like that. And uh, I'm going to pull up the exact thing here, but like everyone will look at, at Duchesne's, at Duchesne's kind of season from two years ago, he had 43 year, 43 goals for set a Nashville record and, and everything like that. But, and and everyone's like, oh, well, maybe the Stars got a guy who's two years removed from a 43-goal season. I don't think Matt Duchesne's going to be a 30-goal scorer ever again in his career. Matt Duchesne, during that 40-goal season, shot 18 point, had an 18.9% shooting percentage. That's a ridiculous shooting percentage, 18.9%. For his career, he's shooting 13.1% for his career, Right. For his career, and on average, I'm about to do some math on this podcast. On average, he shoots, he averages 2.45 shots per game. So, and yeah. Duchesne has never, Duchesne has never played more, has never played 80, has only played 82 games once in his career. He is not the most durable player. Um, so, if we assume he's going to play 75 games this season and he's going to average 2.45 shots per game, that's 184 shots in a season, and he scores on 13% of them. That's 23.88 goals. He had 22 with Nashville last year. Yeah. Shot 13.1%. That's who he is. Matt Duchesne is a 20 goal scorer who shoots 13%. Do I want to pay 8 million for that player? No. That's why Nashville bought him out. Do I want to pay 3 million? Heck yes. So that's why Matt Duchesne will be a success in, in Dallas this season with the exact same production he had in Nashville last year. That's we should, why he's we should a beast. really do like a. That's why he's a beast, that? folks. That's why he's a beast. Yeah. I'm I'm repping we you, should, man. We should really do a like Gavin. We should really do like before camp. We should do just a full fair expectation episode. Just go through the roster and love like, it. What is fair? Ex- we should do that. We should do that. We should Sounds put great. that into our uh, next into week. Our collective brains for a, next a, what's week. A fair, but but like like I'm saying that right now on on Duchesne. Like I think it's a wonderful deal for Dallas. It's a great ad. Three million dollars for a twenty goal score. That's great. He's going to be the star's fifth or sixth leading goal scorer this year. Um, that's great at $3 million. But do not expect him to be a 40 goal scorer because then you'll run into the trap that Nashville ran into of thinking he's an $8 million player mm-hmm. and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I also do love his face off percentage win. Yeah. I, I think he's oh, really that's good. good. In no, that, 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 that adds a lot too. But yeah. it's the, it's the, when you add a goal scorer, right? That's the like, mm-hmm. oh, well, he's a goal scorer. Like, I mean, he is a goal scorer, yeah. but he's not a, it's not like he added another Jason Roberts. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, Ken Jr. asks, who are your initial call-ups in the event of an injury? Uh, left, right, center, and defense. Whew. <laughs> I guess I guess we have to see who's playing well in Texas. Uh, I, I would uh, say, uh, you know, right now, defense. I, I would say if you're going to call someone up as of right now, like right now, your first call up would probably be Gavin Bayruth. Yeah, that's that's what Gavin Bayer was signed to do. Yes. He will he will be the first call up. Um the I mean from the we talked we just talked all about Trevor City, right? Like Maverick Bork and Logan Stankhoven will have a chance starting this week to start proving they should be the first guy called up, but um guys like Nick, I mean, people forget Nick Camano's still in the system, mm-hmm. right? Nick Camano's going to, Nick Camano's 25, is trusted by coaches. Um, same thing with Frederick Carlstrom's down there. Like, yeah. those are kind of the guys who have coaches trust yep. and can be plugged in for to play eight minutes yep. if an injury calls. Yeah, so great that's call. Probably yeah. your first. So, yeah, he played real well, Carlstrom did last year. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. 
Let's go to Euro Crawl, who says, say the stars would be for sale, reasons be damned. How much would Tommy G get in your estimation? Well, to do that, we need to look at the Ottawa sale and see what that was. And then from there, we can calculate, but it would be a lot more than Ottawa. Yeah, well, I mean, Ottawa sold for, it was the, because uh, the stars, I believe, our most recent valuation was, hold on, I want to pull this up on Forbes. Like, so Forbes had the stars as of. Uh, One billion for Ottawa, by the way. Yeah, it was a sale for Ottawa. Yeah. The, the stars were at valuation in November of 2022. I believe Forbes has their valuations in, 20, in November each year was 915 million. And so I want to real quick, I want to uh, a quick clarifier to everyone. Cause I've talked to people who have bought and sold hockey teams before um, the valuations that you see are not actual sale prices. Cause these things aren't houses. Like there's not um, it's, there's only 32 of them in the world. It's, it's, it's such, it's, a, it's, it's like buying, buying hockey teams is more like buying, Art. buying the Mona Lisa like if, if you like, hypothetically right it's if you wanted to compare if buying the it's more buying the Dal- buying the Mona Lisa is more similar to buying a hockey team than buying a house is. so don't think about buying a hockey team like buying a house because if you don't get as as much as if, you, if you're buying a house well there's going to be another house for sale there's going to be another one there's not going to be another one there's only so many pieces of priceless art in the world there's only 32 NHL teams so these valuations that are out there, everything like that, are more so just kind of rough eyeball things of like what they are. Like, like for example, if we were to do to kind of give people the the NFL equivalent in Dallas, and I, I just just because I, I think it's the best way to to do it right now, and I, I don't like comparing everything to the NFL, but this is just a good I think way to do it. So. Like the Cowboys are the most valuable team in the world or the most valuable team in the NFL at $9 billion. Right, Gavin? Yep. If Jerry tomorrow came and said, I'm going to sell the Cowboys. And if this happens on the, if this happens on your station tomorrow, I want to come on by the way, because I, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> the, uh, if, if Jerry's, if Jerry was to go and say, I'm going to sell the Cowboys, he's getting triple that. He's not yeah. getting 9 billion. Yes. He's getting way more than 9 billion. So, NHL team valuations is probably not the three X of there. Like the stars valued at 915, 920 million right now. Um, It's probably close to the two X. So I would imagine the stars with the market they're in with sports gambling, becoming legalized here sooner than later. Um, Texas, uh, the, the Texas um, legislature meeting every two years because people were scared to travel as cowboys comes back into play here which is hilarious um the at some point though it will be sports betting will be fully legal in texas yep um if tom glardy was to put the cow the, the dallas stars up for sale tomorrow 1.6 1.7 billion yeah probably yeah i don't know that's that's kind of that's my that's my back of napkin math right now so. yeah and, and the reality is you said that there aren't many sports teams for sale and sports is a hot investment right now yeah. So it's so. it's the thing to do, and a lot of celebrities want to be involved, and uh, a lot of people are making a lot of money off of sports. So because the evaluations yeah. just keep going up and going up at a high pace compared to other investments. Okay, uh, let's see. Let's go to Coach Kitchen, who says, "Let's look into the crystal ball. The next decade of stars hockey. When is their window strongest? Is it now? Or are we still a few years from being even more powerful?" What's great about a few years is then you're looking at your Borks, your Stankovens, your Wyatt Johnstons still, a Robertsons, Hayskin, and you got a lot of young players I'm mentioning. So hopefully the window has been extended due to the Stars' recent success as far as prospects that have made it into the majors. However, I will say my opinion is it's now because Pavelski won't be around. You know, you you still have. Jamie Ben coming off a real good season. You have Tyler Sagan before those guys move on. I think the window is really strong right now. Well, I, I think the stars are one of the few teams that's positioned to win a cup right now and to be a contender five years from now. A lot of the teams are, are not, can't check both those boxes. Um, now I will always go with right now. There's the certainty of now, um, 
Logan Stankoven, Maverick Bork, Liam Bixwell, all three could be busts. Just like it's just it's yeah. you don't you don't know that. You don't know that. I mean, remember when at one point we were like, Oh man, look what's coming. Julius Honka, Jack Campbell. Oh, <laughs> oh here we go. <laughs> so just like I'm I'm telling you, like it's 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 the it's the cert they're all the future's always fun and exciting, but you have a certainty right now where going into this season, the stars should be one of the top one of should be one of the four teams in my view with the best chance of winning the western conference which yep. means then you're you have a chance of winning the stanley cup and there's the certainty of right now and um the stars can win the stanley cup right now if the answer to your question is like if you were to go through the list of all 32 teams and the answer was yes no can this team win the stanley cup right now if the answer is yes right now the answer is then this is the team that you're it's it's now versus the future yep uh, i agree no so it's 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 now yep it is now and that's it's not that that's not knocking the future it's just i don't like are you gonna i don't where are you gonna find where are you gonna find uh we don't like for example we don't know what who's gonna be replace joe pavelski someday right like at some point father time will get joe pavelski yeah like so things like that yeah yeah Sam Green, all right, I've accepted who we have for defense, but if this is what we're stuck with, how can we maximize what we have? I understand we need Nils to play well and Harley continue, but lineups, non-young guys, anything else? No, I think you're stuck with what you have right now, and I think if we see anything, we will see some moves at the trade deadline, and I think whether it's a call-up like we saw with Harley last year and his quick development, so I would say this, keep your eye on Texas, and keep your eye on that decor in Texas, as well as keep your eye on the development of Nils. Keep your eye on the development of Harley. And regular season and playoffs, Sean, I look at two different factors. You know, I I might be old school, but I think it tightens up in the playoffs. I think it becomes a lot more physical. I, I think that's where we saw some flaws in the Stars' defense. And I look at the Stanley Cup winners. I look at Vegas got tougher. Colorado got tougher on their blue line. So I would like to see them get a little bit more toughness. Um, but at the same time, I think we are what we are right now. Yeah, I um, I would like to see, I, I have a, I would like to see just the experiment, just to see what it does. I would love to see from opening night, I would love to see a four, a four or five combo as your top pairing. I would love to see a Miro Heishkin and Nils Lundqvist pairing to start. And I, and I realize, I know, I know, if you, you're throwing your phones down. Nils Lundqvist was scratched in the playoffs. He hasn't earned it. Whatever. Okay. I would, I just, I want to see the experiment play out. I want to see Miro on his strong side. Not that and Miro is the best player no matter what side he plays on, but you might as well get him on his strong side so he's even stronger. And playing with Nils Lundqvist, let Miro skates well enough to cover and everything like that. And let that pair form its own identity. If it doesn't work, scrap it. But I would love to see that from the start because that allows me two things. A, it allows me to create a pairing I can build for kind of long-term. Lundquist is 23, Miro's 24. I can have, count on them for a long time. And it also allows Thomas Harley to be the the lead dog on his own pairing on the left side it allows him to so every single shift so for 45 minutes a night i i think one of the one of the strengths of this stars team gavin is one of the strengths of this stars team and it'll probably it may be the strength on opening night it may be the strength on december 15th depending on tom, how thomas harley starts the season one of the strengths is 45 minutes a night you're facing either thomas harley or miro hishkin that is one of the strengths of the stars team and I think uh, so. You talk about this is the group you've got and everything like that. I think you've got to see if you can try to add if a little bit of the physicality. Maybe this is where where I, you play hockey and paw with with Harley or um, I. I just think you've got a couple pieces that you can't put together right now because they slog the game down too much. Uh, David Castillo wrote a nice piece the other day about Esselin Dell and Yanni, ha Yanni Hakenba. I like, 
I, I don't think they can play together anymore. Like they can, they can, they can kill penalties together, but I don't think they should be other than late game defensive situations. You're trying to get a clear or something like that. Like, I don't think Lindell and Hawk and Pa should be on the ice together anymore. So you got to keep them separated. Um, I don't, I personally would, I don't mind one of them. I, I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't mind one of them with Suter if it's the third pair, but you run into a little bit of the, the Ryan Suter minute demand, yeah. which is always going to be an interesting thing to play with. I mean, I think if Ryan really Suter the was the third thing. pairing, I don't think people would complain as much. A hundred percent, Gavin. Honestly, if he was playing 14, 15 minutes a night, really that's good. It. <laughs> yeah, be fine. So yeah, it's, I, if that's kind of the thing, it's yeah, that's going to be one of the big like, yeah. All right, uh, our friend Fuzzy says, "Hey, I just want to share a frosty with you, amigo. Super cool. I didn't write a book called We Win Here, um, but <laughs> you know, I could tell some stories. <laughs> yeah, or maybe, maybe we'll grab a frosty with uh, Sean at some point." Blackout Dallas says, "Who would some of the other prospects that fans need to pay attention to during the prospect tournament, other than Stankoven and Bork? We did touch on that, but I definitely yeah. wanted to shout you out uh, for the tweet. Thank you so much, Blackout Dallas." Uh, John Knight says, who coaches the prospects in Traverse City? Regardless, do coaches from the NHL and AHL or other leagues make the trip? Good question. It is the uh, Texas Stars coaching staff is coaching it. And um, the whether a coach is, whether an NHL coach is there is really dependent on geography and who's there. Um for example, we talked about the time Miro played in Traverse City. Jim Mon- I was Jim Montgomery's first season as coach. Jim Montgomery came up to Traverse City to watch Miro Hishkinen because he wanted to build a better relationship with Miro Hishkinen. I typically don't see the Stars head coach in Traverse City. Even last year, like even like the Stars head coach typically does not come up to Traverse City. There's got to be a player really worth his time and investment. Now, the other teams, it's a little bit different. Detroit's head coach will be there because it's – three hours from Detroit. Um, Toronto tends to Toronto. uh, Sheldon Keefe may be there because it's a little bit closer, but um, so it's, uh, but it's coached by uh, Neil Graham. The Texas stars head coach will be coaching the prospect team. There you go. Uh, Let's see. Jason Rosenbaum writes, what happened to all the post game free taco and what not sponsorships for a goal in the second period or whatever reason. They still do the Dr. Pepper section, but I did I did dig the tacos because they did a real good job of it's raining tacos and everything like that. So just to, just to pull back the curtain, a lot of times when companies come in, they say, hey, we want to be unique, we want to be different. So I'm sure if the stars, if a new company comes in and wants to sponsor the stars and they have beverages or something like tacos, I'm sure that promotion will be brought back. So it really has to do with the sponsorship level as far as, you know, looking to create something uh, unique. So you might see something different this year, but I, it was cool because I think, you know, the fans got into it. I also used to like the uh, the little blimp balloon, Sean, that mm-hmm. used to drop those, uh, like, little gift certificates through, you know, in between periods. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I, I, did, I did enjoy that. I'm always fascinated by the people diving for a free T-shirt. I will buy those people a t-shirt to save them some injury. That's always fascinating. Mm -hmm. And if you're at a stars game this year, folks, and a puck comes to you and you are 16 or over, please hand it to the kid in your section. Uh, Unless you, unless the one caveat. Okay. uh, The one caveat is if like, if you make like a ridiculous, if you make like a highlight real catch that gets, that's getting you on sports center, that's fine. Like, I think like, like if, if a puck is like shot into the stands and you're, uh, and, and you're in, and you've got two beers in your hand and you like catch it with your mouth or something like that, keep that puck. All like right. If you do something, that, if you do something that's truly impressive, keep it. But yeah. 99.99999% of all those are not impressive. It's a little puck shot over the glass that yeah. landed at your feet. Give it to a Yeah. Kid. I've had one and uh, I had a guy try to wrestle it away. <laughs> I just said, no. And I just grabbed the puck, and there was a, a, a small girl in the section, and uh, I gave it to her. My story, though, when I was in college was, and I'll never forget, it was the Red Sox against the Toronto Blue Jays. The third baseman, Kelly Gruber, was fouling him off in our section, and a fly ball came our way, 
And I brought to the game the starting center fielder for the collegiate baseball team. And he was like waving people off like <laughs> like people weren't going to try to get the ball anyway. Anyway, it tips off his fingertips, Sean. At the same time, some guy hits me from behind. So I go down to my knees and I see this ball trickle down into the nacho plate that I had in the third inning. So oh. I grab the entire nacho plate as people are wrestling with me and I have it against my chest. I stand up, the nacho plate is attached to my sweater. And I pull, peel it off to which unveils the Kelly Gruber foul ball. I have no victory idea what well happened to that foul ball. A yeah. victory, well, uh, victory well earned. <laughs> yeah, ruin the sweatshirt. Sweatshirt, $50 out, but man, yeah. that foul ball. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but those are, you know, I love those kinds yeah. of memories that, you know, many people yeah. have. All right. Uh, yeah. How Wei, who is a great supporter of Spits and Suds like you all are, asks, if you could bring back one former star great and put him on this team, who would it be and why? I would say Hatcher. My selection, Sean, is Sergei Zubov. What's yours? Well, it's the, uh, we're talking about in their prime, like picking sure. a player in their in, in their prime. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it, it's Zubov. That's the... If I could run, if I could run a Miro Zubov first pairing, I'd have best defense in the NHL. So. Yeah. I, <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. I, I mean, I Madonna would, would be a good I, selection as well, but I, you know, with the defensive, what we've talked about, Sergei Zubov would certainly solve a lot of those problems. Yeah. Well, I mean, and the the only other, like it's, it, yeah, it's, yeah, that, that's kind of the way I would go on this. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anti Mietnin for shootouts. Is that? What was the name that we came up with a couple of weeks ago? That that guy that just no, it was uh, it was Yusi Okinen. Yusi Okinen, that's right, that's right, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right, that's right. Anti Mietnin was on the same team. Anti Anti Mietnin's a pull, but he wasn't the shootout <laughs> expert. So. All right, Sean, follow Sean Shapiro at Sean Shapiro and follow EP Ringside. Follow Shap Shots. He's going to keep you up to date on what's happening with your stars in the Traverse City tournament. He'll also throw out some other names that are you know, around the league, uh, prospects that are doing well. The name of the book, Support Sean, is We Win Here. You can also support him. He has it on Twitter through his sub stack, and it's just a small fee, but you get exclusive information from Sean Shapiro. You're a beast, my friend. Appreciate you answering all those questions and appreciate you doing the podcast as always. It's always fun, man. It's always fun, and uh, to watch some real hockey tomorrow, so let's do it. Yeah, enjoy Traverse City, my friend. That's going to do it for Spits and Suds. Thanks to each and every one of you that support this program. Don't forget, please tell a friend. We're heading into the season. We're looking for new people to listen to Spits and Suds. We want to remain the number one podcast here in DFW for hockey, for your Dallas Stars. So please tell a friend, hey, these guys are grinding. These guys are working hard. We can't wait for the season to start. So that's going to do it for Spits and Suds. I'm Gavin Spittle. Have a great day, everybody.